Today, the death of coal. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. There were a couple of interesting articles in the conversation recently relating to the death of coal-fired power in Australia. Chris Briggs, the research principal for sustainable futures at the University of Technology, said the government still has no plans to help the workforces related to the coal fire power station closures. Yalorn Power Station, Australia's oldest, dirtiest coal plant, will close four years ahead of schedule in 2028. Announcing the move last week, Operator Energy Australia said it will build a giant energy storage battery on the site to make room for more renewables. This, he said, is a powerful statement about where our energy system is heading. Your lawn has operated for 47 years burning brown coal. It supplies one-fifth of Victoria's energy and employs 500 permanent workers and hundreds more contractors. It's also responsible for 13% of Victoria's emissions. In response to the announcement, Federal Energy Minister Angus Taylor said, Our thoughts are with the workers, their families and local business owners who rely on the power station for their livelihoods. So... He asks, what exactly is the federal government doing to help the 10,000 domestic coal workers set to lose their jobs when Yalorn and other coal power stations shut down? At the moment, the federal government isn't offering anything more than platitudes. Over the next 15 years, the Australian energy market operator, AEMO, projects most of Australia's 20-odd coal plants will also close. Australia urgently needs investment and policy solutions to manage this inevitable transition. Without it, workers and electricity consumers will be left dangerously exposed. Solar and wind energy are now the cheapest forms of new electricity generation. As the former chief executive of AEMO, Audrey Zeibelman, stated last year, it is inevitable we are at a position where the existing coal fleet is coming to the end of its technical life and is going to retire. Renewable energy has grown to 25-30% to of the market, placing enormous pressures on coal file generators and lowering their market share. In fact, a recent study estimates that by 2025, as many as five Australian coal power stations could be unprofitable. At the last federal election, the Morrison government claimed 50% renewable energy by 2030 would be ruinous for our economy. But now several expert energy analysts estimate that renewable projects already in the pipeline could see 50% renewable occur as early as 2025. Australia is not well prepared for the closure of coal-powered stations. It has no national climate and energy policy, and unlike nations such as Germany and Spain, there is no timetable for closures or agreements in place to manage the exit of coal-powered stations. Under the national electricity rules, generators are required to give three years' notice for a closure, but the penalties for failing to do so are not a significant deterrent relative to the incentives to stay in the market as long as possible. A recent Sydney Morning Herald report quoted an energy market source who said coal plant owners are playing a game of chicken. They're holding on and hoping another plant closes, which would tighten supply, raise electricity prices, and improve the financial viability of remaining generators. And the closure of Laurent is too far away to challenge the equation for other coal power stations. A risk. Without effective regulation or policy, regional coal communities are most likely left relying on the owner's goodwill or fear of reputational damage to do the right thing. Already, we've seen the damage planned and unplanned coal plant closures can have on workers and consumers. After the Hazelwood power station in the Latrobe Valley closed in 2016 with just a few months' notice, data presented to the Victorian Parliament in 2019 showed just one in three workers had found full-time work and one in four 
were unemployed. What's more, electricity prices spiked once Hazelwood supply was pulled from the market, demonstrating the risks to electricity supplies and consumers when coal exits don't happen in an orderly manner. Regional coal communities need time to adjust to the energy transition. If a string of Australian coal stations close at short notice, the social and economic impacts could be devastating. In the case of Lyon, the Victorian government negotiated an agreement, including seven years' notice of the closure and support for the workforce, such as retraining. Some coal plant operators will also be likely taking the lead. In 2017, AGL gave five years' notice that the Liddell coal plant in the New South Wales Hunter Valley would close in 2022. The shutdown has since been pushed back to 2023. The company is now investing in transition measures for the site and workforce. Heavy-handed intervention by the federal government has made attracting investments harder for Liddell and could do the same for Lyon. Renewable energy already creates more jobs, just under 30,000, than the domestic coal sector. Most of these jobs are currently in construction, but by the mid-2030s, as many as half could be in ongoing operation and maintenance as the fleet of renewable projects grows. This number will increase further, but while renewable projects will create some new jobs in coal regions, most will be in other regional areas and the capital cities. It seems almost everyone recognises the reality of coal power's inevitable demise, except the federal government. AEMO projects a grid dominated by renewable energy by 2035. Almost all of Australia's banks and insurers have committed to exit thermal coal between 2030 and 2035. And the New South Wales, Queensland and Victorian governments are establishing renewable energy zones to fast-track the growth of renewable energy before coal plants retire. And there are initiatives to grow regional jobs, such as the New South Wales Renewable Sector Board, the Latrobe Valley Authority, and collaborations such as the Hunter Jobs Alliance. These are all important and meaningful initiatives, but without a national policy or a process for coal exits, they're operating in a vacuum without timeframes. Australia should start looking to overseas experience, where governments are establishing transition authorities and injecting funds to diversify regional economies and retrain workers. The European Union, for example, has set up a 17.5 billion euro just transition fund and national agreements between the government, industry, unions and communities to phase out coal have been negotiated in Germany and Spain. There's little prospect of this happening anytime soon in the current Australian political climate, but a range of models have been advocated here. This includes auctions to stagger closures or coal owners nominating a closure window and depositing money in a fund as insurance against that commitment. Whatever the model, a policy solution for the demise of coal is urgently needed across levels of government, energy planners and local communities. Otherwise, it's likely to be a bumpy ride for coal workers and the electrical system. And Richard Holden, the Professor of Economics at UNSW, in the conversation's vital sign said, the timing of Lyon's closure shows it's high time for a carbon price. He said that some of the impacts of Lyon's closure might be mitigated by Energy Australia's plan to build a 350 megawatt battery, which is 3.5 times the capacity of South Australia's big battery in Hornsdale, larger than any now existing near the company's gas-fired power station in the Latrobe Valley. But the critical question in all of this is whether Australia's coal-fired power stations are being retired too slowly or potentially even too quickly. It's hard to know, he says, without a price on carbon to create a level playing field for renewable energy and fossil fuels. We need a carbon price that reflects the social cost of carbon. The best evidence that this is around $51 US per metric tonne. What we have instead is a hodgepodge of clumsy, government interventions on both sides of the ledger. Yes, there are subsidies for renewable generation, such as wind and solar, but there's perhaps as much as 15 billion Aussie dollars a year in implicit subsidies for fossil fuels. These subsidies stem from things such as the fuel tax credit scheme, aviation fuel excise concessions, accelerated depreciation through effective life caps on power plants, fringe benefit tax concessions, uplift provisions in the petroleum resource rent tax, and more. All of this creates huge uncertainty about if 
and when Australia's remaining 16 coal-fired power plants will close. When will their workers need transition assistance to begin? Are we sending the right price signals for those considering investing in alternative forms of power generation? Are we going to have enough reliability in the system to avoid blackouts or brownouts? These issues about transition of companies, workers and indeed whole communities from fossil fuels to green energy are not limited to power generation plants. Far from it. All sectors of the economy will be affected, though some more than others. For instance, as electric vehicles replace petrol or diesel-powered vehicles, what will happen to petrol stations? Electric charging stations don't need the same real estate. How many will be decommissioned? How many will remain as convenience stores? What's the timeline? The key point is that the weird combination of government policies subsidising both green energy and fossil fuels has no clear connection to the relative price of those energy alternatives. These policies thus provide no clear signal to influence consumers and business decisions. It is impossible to make sense predictions about how our energy mix will evolve and hence how to respond to that evolution. Worse still, government policy is subject to change at any time, even without a change of government. This adds a big slather of political uncertainty on top of the existing economic uncertainty. The Yalon closure will be a wake-up call for both sides of politics that a transition to green energy run by government fiat is going to be a very messy affair at best and a complete disaster at worst. In fact, the Hazelwood closure in 2017 should have been that wake-up call. Let's hope politicians at least get the message. This time, he says, putting a price on carbon has become the ultimate political issue. Labour is scared to death of losing another election by supporting such a price. Even with the possible exception of Joel Fix given, it's known it's the right policy. Scott Morrison's Liberal Party is so wedded to using technology versus taxes as a political wedge, it can't even see the right policy anymore. The Parliamentary National Party, meanwhile, can't appreciate what many of their constituents do know, that the carbon price would provide enormous economic opportunities in rural and regional Australia. Our energy transition is in disarray. It will only get worse without a price on carbon and the end of subsidies for all forms of energy. Failure to do so will merely sow the seeds for more transition problems in the years to come. So yet another example of the government not getting its house in order, not executing appropriate planning and thinking, and frankly, just bouncing from marketing spin to marketing spin. This is not good for our future. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.